is going to be a, a wild program. We're going to go into areas tonight that we don't go into nearly often enough, and we talk about it. In fact, when I look at the Internet as the beast that it is, one of the most common terms I see coming up in alternative media posts and essays and stories is MK Ultra. He's MK Ultra. She's MK Ultra. It's an MK Ultra program. Well, okay, at least people are thinking on the right side of the picket fence. The truth of the matter is, MK Ultra is ancient. It's ancient history. MK Ultra was actually the code name of a U.S. government human research operation experimenting in the behavioral engineering of, of us. And it was conducted through guess who's? Well, it was the CIA's Scientific Intelligence Division. That CIA project, as some of you may know, was coordinated with the Special Ops Division of the Army's Chemical Corps. Interesting collusion there. The program, now get this, this is what I'm talking about. When people start throwing MK Ultra around, they don't know really what they're talking about. The program began in the early 1950s. All right? It's not current. It was sanctioned in 53 officially, then reduced in its scope in the 60s, and finally halted, allegedly, officially, in 1973. Well, I assume that they may well have halted the formal MK Ultra project, but they certainly didn't ultra mind control. They simply took it to the next level. Now, that was 40, 41 years ago. Do you think they might have made progress in 41 years on mind control, how to influence people in ways that they would otherwise never dream of, of acting out, such as mass murder, serial killers, you name it. Uh, the human mind is an electrical device. It's not chemical, it's electrical. We're electrical first. And if you can figure out a way to address, invade, program, that electrical machine, which is what computing is all about, you can pretty much take anyone over and make them do whatever you want. And in many cases, most cases, they don't know anything about it. They haven't a clue that they're being used. So when you, when you use the term MK Ultra, understand you're really talking about horse and buggy terminology and technology, as it was. Our guest tonight, I've wanted to have this young man on for quite a long time. He is, in my view, a prodigy. He is packed full of information. He has a passion to learn, and he has learned a great deal. He is a mind control expert. His name is Neil Sanders. And this is going to be fun because his book is out now, and I'll, there's a little review of it. You can see on his homepage. Click on his name. In the first volume of his book, which is as one of the all-time great titles, Your Thoughts Are Not Your Own, amen to that, Neil Sanders exposes the evidence for officially sanctioned mind control programs. And I might get into the non-officially sanctioned mind control programs, of which I suspect there are many out there, such as TV. Sanders has degrees in psychology, film, and media studies, and is a qualified hypnotherapist as well. He spent many years collecting and analyzing declassified documents, scientific papers, court transcripts, confessions from doctors, and testimony from victims and whistleblowers as well, and much more. Do visit his website. It is extraordinary, and he's up very early in the morning or in the middle of the night. Somewhere it's dark there anyway in the UK. Are you there, Neil, and can you hear me all right? I am. Uh, hi, Jeff. How are you doing? You all right? I'm okay. Thank you. Doing well. And glad to have you along. Thank you for... What time is it over there? It's about quarter past three, so it's about about five hours until I phone in work and lie and tell them that I'm ill. <laughs> all right. If they want a backup, they'll, they can call me. I'll tell them. <laughs> that's, that's fine. He you, was. You give me a note, will you? I will. I will. He was sick. He couldn't. He that's did, very kind of you. Yeah, it's no problem at all. So, Neil Sanders, what got you into this whole field of the dark arts? Why? Why mind control? What is it about that, that intrigues you? And when did you start? 
Well, um, I mean, I got interested in, in mind control. It was a strange, strange experience, really. Basically, a friend of mine, uh, his older brother's friend, uh, pressed me to watch this film, The Manchurian Candidate. And I said, oh, go and watch The Manchurian Candidate. It's got these... I was like, who's in it? It's uh, Frank Sinatra. And I was like, uh-huh. oh, brilliant. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, I've got to watch that. My, my response, exactly. <laughs> yeah, quite. But and it, and it was in black and white as well, so that didn't really interest me terribly. But but I I did watch it, and uh, because you know this guy, I very much respected him. And um, not only did I find the film fascinating, but basically I then started to to look at the sort of things that could be done. And, you know, obviously, you first elements that you start to look at are things like stage hypnotism and hypnosis in general, and that sort of thing, just to see if it works. And I also was was interested in psychology, so I was kind of getting a, a sort of picture about the separation of the mind and how, how the mind is in, in all schools of psychological thought. It, it, it has sections. There are defense mechanisms like amnesic barriers and, and the like. Um, there are uh, short circuits. There are ways that you can get people to respond um, favorably or unfavorably to, to a situation just by the, the use of certain words or body language, um, for example. Like, an example is um, take your sunglasses off if you're speaking to somebody because the eye contact me- means that you connect on a more interpersonal level. Mm-hmm. Just very basic stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Then, obviously, from there, I got interested in, in Sirhan Sirhan and um, the stories about Sirhan Sirhan and obviously the, 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 the fact that he appeared to be uh, under hypnotic control and firing uh, blanks out of his gun that only uh, held eight bullets, but miraculously managed to spray 14 bullets, some of them from behind the, um, uh, the senator's head, which, so, you know, it's a remarkable... He's a quite, uh, quite a trick-shot artist, that guy, yeah. Oh, yes, he's, he's obviously very, very skilled. And then, you know, you look into that and you, you see that, that what he was talking about, saying that he believed that he was at a shooting range. And I started to look at it and I go, okay, that's, that's plausible. That, that's actually plausible from a sort of scientific standpoint as, mm-hmm. as well. Not that mm-hmm. I'm any great scientist, but, you know, it... It, it sort of twigged with me. And then from there, basically, the, what really sort of piqued my interest was the sort of tangential weirdness that was connected to the Manchurian Candidate film. I mean, obviously, it it was released um, shortly uh, before the, the assassinations of the Kennedys, and then Frank Sinatra, who was friends with the Kennedys, uh, had, it, had it banned uh, until the, the mid-'80s. And then you start to look at the, the other weird things about it, like, for example... John Frankenheimer, who's the director, was having dinner with Roman Polanski um, and Robert Kennedy the night, bef- the night before he was assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan, who a lot of people believe to be a Manchurian candidate. That's pretty so, weird, um, Neil. I yeah, didn't, I didn't weird. know that. that that's, uh, that's beyond the probabilities of coincidence. It something. gets a bit strange as well because, the, I mean, the, you know, the, some of these could be coincidences, and they obviously are, but... For example, J. Sebring was the person that sort of stapled the toupee to Frank Sinatra's head, and he was also the person that supplied the drugs for the Camelot crowd, the, uh, you know, the Kennedys, the Peter Law. It was J. Sebring uh, that yes, did absolutely. that? Yes, absolutely. I know yeah, exactly J. where you're going with this. This is going to blow our listeners' minds. Uh, yeah. Well, J. Sebring was one of the victims of the so-called Manson killings. He was killed by Tex, uh, Tex Watson, um, uh, August the 8th, 1969. Um, yeah, he was yeah, a very was famous a hair, hair designer, hairdresser. Yeah, he would have been Vidal Sassoon if it hadn't have been for the fact that he, you know, died. He was actually, uh, through yeah. Sebring International, he was marketing a range of uh, hair products for men. Yep. You know, this is, again, that comes into a sort of concept of mind control, because up until that point, it was considered a bit namby-pamby for, for men to be concerned with their, their appearance in any great way. And then he got very, very sort of macho people, or considered macho people like time. Steve McQueen and Frank Sinatra, to, to publicly advocate him. Um, yeah, and then obviously he became one of the victims of the Manson uh, murders, or the so-called Manson murders. Mm-hmm. Bizarrely, Dee Dee Lansbury was living at the Chatsworth Ranch, um, you know, the Spahn Ranch, for, for a short time, and uh, traveling around with the Manson family. In her pocket, she had a signed note from Angela Lansbury giving her permission to be away from her parents. What? Yes. Yeah, this, yeah. this is Angela Lansbury. Yeah. Unbelievable. A permission slip for murder, she wrote, apparently. This is, uh, this is remarkable. Well, well this, this is the this, point, you know. Yeah, this, this, let me just say one thing. What what Neil has just laid out here 
is the substance already that a, a major book could be written about. We're talking about connections that are just really bizarre. J. Sebring is a name that most of you probably forgot. I, I remember the name because it was one of those names. It's a great name. Sebring International, J. Sebring. I mean, he obviously was going to be a mega star, a mega celebrity. And that was, that was ended. Angela Lansbury. Now, tell us a little bit more about Angela Lansbury and, and that, that connection. I'm very interested in that for a number of reasons. Well, I mean, basically, that, that was it, really. Her daughter wanted to go and hang out with this bunch of hippies that she met at the uh, Chatsworth, uh, the Spahn uh -huh. Ranch, yeah. which was an ex-movie ranch, sure. where people like Ronald Reagan, here's an interesting one as well, the gun that was used to kill Jay Sebring was... It was stolen. Well, it was given to a, a, a guy called Randy Starr, who was a stunt man on a film, and it was given to him by a young cowboy, a, a young actor playing a cowboy, who went by the name of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> so, so the gun that was used to kill Jay Sebring was actually once in the possession of Ronald Reagan. How bizarre! How Quite. truly bizarre! All right, the, go, the, the, yeah. The, the, I mean, the, the Angela Lansbury thing was just simply that, but I mean. The other person that was that was famous that occasionally hung out with the, the Manson family was Dina Martin, which was Dean Martin's daughter. She was actually the person that introduced Nancy Pittman to the group. Nancy Pittman was also known as Brenda McCann. And she was considered one of the sort of more hardcore. Um, uh -huh. You know, the whole Manson thing's a bit of a misnomer anyway. So, But she was considered one of the sort of hardcore members of the clan. So, you know, these, these sort of brushes with celebrity... Mm -hmm. happened. Mm -hmm. the, the strange thing was that the, the other strange connection to um, MK Ultra was that Roman Polanski, who was obviously the husband of Sharon Tate, who was killed in the Tate murders, mm -hmm. obviously, he was in London at the time trying to get together a film called Day of the Dolphins. Now, Day of the Dolphins was based on the experiments of uh, Dr. John Lilly, who was con connected to MK Ultra's subproject 62. Mm -hmm. And specifically what John Lilly was doing, I mean, John Lilly did a lot of things. He he actually mapped the pleasure and pain centers of the brain. He was the, one of the first people to do this uh, and therefore prove that by electrical stimulation, you could manipulate people to do things by either making them feel intense pleasure or intense pain. And, and he sort of expanded this onto um, uh, dolphins, cats, dogs, and that sort of thing, injecting LSD into the brains, and, but also basically trying to, to get them to be a sort of remote control device you know those, um, we actually still have them, we have dolphins that have got like nuclear warheads attached to them and occasionally yeah. they sort of go, go astray and so they're mm -hmm. sort of floating around like some sort of terrifying but awful Bond villain. And, um, and basically they were doing that and this was one of the things that they were doing in MK Ultra. Roman Polanski was actually trying to get a film about that scenario going and he was in London at the time that his wife was killed trying to get this film Day of the Dolphin going. But in in his film, the dolphins could actually talk and they were going to be the heroes of the piece. Uh, but unfortunately, That's, you know, mm. that vision will never see the light of day. No, no. Then, that, this, uh, you mentioned another name that's suitable for a program. I'd love to do more on Dr. John Lilly. What a strange, oh, yeah. what a strange dude he was. Uh, Absolutely. He, uh, he, we, I've talked on this program about the so-called Lilly wave before. Now, the Lilly wave is a certain electromagnetic frequency. And uh, I don't know if you know, let me tell this little quick story, Neil. You may find it of interest. Sure. Uh, Pat, Dr. Pat Flanagan went over to visit a friend of his uh, in his laboratory, which was actually his garage in his home. He lived in a suburban neighborhood. And down every block, of course, were electrical wires and telephone poles and so forth and transformers and all that. Well, Pat Flanagan went into the garage and the the guy he knew was in there working on a bench, and there was a, an oscilloscope there. On the oscilloscope was, was a waveform, which is well known. It's the Lily Wave. People in that line of work know the Lily Wave by sight pretty well. Mm. And he went up to his friend. He said, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm just doing this and that. And he said, what are you doing with the Lily Wave on there? And his friend looked up at Pat Flanagan and said, you're not going to believe this. He said, guess where it's coming from? And Pat said, I, I don't know. He said, it's coming from there. And he pointed to the wall plug. It was coming from the electric grid. And it didn't get there on its own. 